uh, across the um, uh, internet in recent times, particularly from a, um, a fellow uh, who has written a letter about e-states. Uh, and in that, he has made a number of assumptions and pushed this. <clears throat> He's also attacked anyone else trying to provide clarity to this. But I want to make this absolutely clear. You cannot be a beneficiary and a trustee of the same trust. You cannot be the beneficiary and the trustee of the same trust, whether it be a testamentary trust or a living trust, an inter vivos trust. So whenever you hear or see anyone say, uh, I am the grantor, the beneficiary, uh, I am the trustee and the beneficiary, either they have no idea what they're talking about because that is completely against trust law, all trust law, or they are deliberately trying to continue to keep you in a state of incompetence, which is something we'll be talking about in a moment about Sister KV, a very important state that they want you to remain in because if you remain incompetent, then you have absolutely no rights of law, No. So five, um, in a trust, a separate and unique set of accounts held by the trustee, uh, also known as a separate fund for the recording. Uh, six, the formalisation of the rights conveyed uh, into some kind of legal title. <clears throat> now, people get confused about legal title and equitable title, so let, let's just be clear. The trustee owns the property once it's conveyed. That's why the Roman cult created it the way they did it. They They didn't and they, they knew they couldn't claim to be the owners. That was the whole point. The divine is the owner. So they wanted to create a role where effectively they are, are the owners without arrogantly claiming to be the owners. And that is the trustee. Now, some of you may have heard the word curia before. I hope you have. The word curia in Latin actually means trustee. That's what it actually means. So when you go on to Wikipedia and these other sites that <clears throat> sometimes have good information but other types <laughs> don't, um, it, it'll go on to this whole blurb that uh, the Curia was some special part or the roof of a Senate or had something to do with the Senate. It's all complete rubbish. It is complete and utter lies. The Senate, the name for the Senate was the Senate. That was the name of the Roman Senate. The Curia was a group of trustees. So just by looking at Latin, you can understand exactly what the Roman cult's doing. The highest body of the Roman cult of the Holy See of the Vatican is the Curia. What are they? They're trustees. If you are trustees, you are trustees of what? You can't be trustees of nothing. You have to be trustees of a trust. Well, when did that trust first get established? 1302, Ornum Sanctum, we own the world, no one objected, it's a lawful conveyance, game, set and match. That's the basis of their system. Now, of course, it is an unlawful conveyance and we tackle that in other ways, but I, I don't think tonight we'll have the time to go through that. But as we do work our way through this, I hope, if I am invited back, that I can talk to you about ecclesiastical deed polls, divine trusts, and true trusts, and how, in fact, the whole Unum Sanctum is blown out of the water uh, in one swoop. So, trusts have certain structures to them, certain logic. Now, while the system was created for negative means, the concept of a trust, and indeed the concept of property itself, is not intrinsically evil. It is logical. It's just used for evil because it's used as a form of control of the planet rather than a form of fairness uh, and, uh, and fair distribution. Instead, it's used for evil. This is why in positive law, we do not depreciate or abrogate the concept of trust we merely identify clearly what it is and then show very clearly uh, how it will be from this point on. 
So, <clears throat> there are two types of trusts in the Roman system. There is the living trust, and then there's the testamentary trust. Now, the first trust created in 1302, there was no differentiation. A trust was a trust, and they had not conceived at that point of the benefit of turning all trust into testamentary trust. But later, uh, by about 1530, 1532, under the reign of Henry VIII, uh, the Venetians, um, who founded and sponsored the um, enormous wealth that poured into uh, England in the reign of Henry VIII, extraordinary wealth, um, used that as a Trojan to get in the concept of, of uh, e-state, of testamentary trust. So now when we look at the Roman system, there are two types, a living trust called an inter vivos trust and a testamentary trust. So what's the difference? Well, uh, a living trust, the grantor is living and the trust exists for a certain period. Uh, it may still be an irrevocable trust, but it, it usually exists for the period that the trustees are granted rights to administer the property and that may be forever or it may be for a certain time. The express trust by the uh, canon, 13, no, not canon, sorry, the, the papal bull of 1302, Ornum Sanctum, is an irrevocable um, trust that continues for as long as the cure exists and as long as the, the, the uh, property is, is not contested. But this for their system was not enough <clears throat> because, of course, if the grantor is still alive, then one may challenge the legitimacy of the trust. In their mind, the perfect trust, the trust that absolutely is almost bulletproof, is one where the grantor is dead, gone, buried, and you are then representing as a religious group uh, or a legal group the administration of that as the administrator executor. This is the testamentary trust from which we get the body corporate being the e-state. Now, the uh, testamentary trust uh, only comes into life when the grantor dies. So no testamentary trust can exist without there being a living trust first. So the living trust, express trust created by Unum Sanctum is still in force today, but the creation of the uh, Crown uh, companies, the Crown estates, uh, and, and certainly in the 1530s through England, the creation of the concept of e-state uh, is the birth of the testamentary trust. Now I'm going to uh, now move to e-states to explain what an e-state is in the con context of a testamentary trust. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say one thing about trust. I mentioned in the Roman system, there are only two types, uh, inter vivos, a living trust, and a testamentary trust. But in fact, there is a third kind of trust. Uh, and, and in saying this, of course, you may, some of you may say, well, I've heard of implied trust and constructive trust and express trust and all these others. What does he mean by there's only two types? How do these all fit in? <clears throat> I don't want to confuse because it is done to deliberately confuse, like Leams. I, I am not getting into the confusing categorization that is applied to, <coughs> excuse me, how a trust um, may differ from another trust in some minute way. I'm talking about the fundamental structures and principles at the highest level that differentiate types of trust. Now, if you're talking in the Roman system, the most fundamental difference at a trust level is when a trust is administered in a living sense and a trust is administered in a deceased sense, hence inter vivos and testamentary. Of course, within living trusts, there are different structures. But I, I am a great believer that, that studying whether something is implied, constructive, um, sestake, unfortunately gets you down into rabbit holes that actually don't add any value to it. So I prefer to recommend, and I, I hope those listening un, understand and appreciate this, that you don't need to get into um, 
semantic discussions of whether something is created as a pure trust, a, a, a express trust, or anything. If you create a trust today and you do not establish a divine right, then that trust automatically is assumed to be within the higher trust. That is, if someone creates a pure trust today and is not able to express their rights in the form of the covenant of one heaven, in the canons of divine law, then whether you realise it or not, you have created a trust subject to the rules of Roman law. Why? Because what is right? What is property? The highest right of use, the highest property is divine right. And the Roman cult are the ones that have claimed until now, until being challenged, to have the highest right. So don't get tricked into, into believing when people say, oh, I'm just going to go off and create a pure trust or express trust and <clears throat> I don't need any of this gump. I can do it. I believe in God. God's my witness. I'm going to do it. No. In law, <clears throat> sorry, it doesn't work. It does not work. Uh, it has to be part of a system. I'll give you another example. It's a bit like people saying, well, <clears throat> we're not going to subscribe to the Constitution anymore. We're going to go off and create our own uh, society. Well, <clears throat> any society that uses a concept of a charter, a deed, or any legal instrument to claim its independence, unless it has already formed a body of law that defines law as what law is, which is what these canons do, means that you have actually created a subsidiary entity within the laws of Rome. So there are two types in the Roman system, living trusts and testamentary trusts. But there is a third trust, and we won't have time tonight to talk about it, but it is a vital trust, a crucial trust, and it is the concept of divine trust. That is, the understanding that if the divine creator is the ultimate owner, then we believe, hopefully when you read, you will also believe, that the divine creator never agreed to us being slaves and never agreed for our souls to be collateral and never agreed for this group of satanic Luciferian worshippers to grab control of the earth. And how do we prove that? We prove that by showing that divine trusts exist as the highest form of trust and the absence of them is a fatal weakness of the trust law of the Roman cult. Now, how is that possible? Well, law is an argument. At the end of the day, law is an argument. Remember I said earlier, and I've said a lot of words, and I'm sorry for saying so much, but hopefully if you listen back, you'll see earlier I said that the difference uh, that took place is these minds realised that they could come up with an argument that went beyond just the simple rules of might is right, fear, paramilitary, overt force that kept people in line, <clears throat> that they could in fact come up with a form of argument in the law that if people consented to would give them uh, a system of voluntary servitude a system that managed itself, a system of willing slaves. And that's precisely part of the assumptions in building this system. So I'm now moving to Article 99 to talk about estates. And I'm mindful that we're heading towards the top of the first hour. And just um, because there's so much information that I'm sharing with you, what I'd like to do is only spend about another 25 minutes uh, talking about e-states and SESTA KV, and then I'd like to stop and, and open up however we do this uh, to answer questions that um, I'm sure a number of you have. So I'm now on to Article 99 on positive law in defining estates. <clears throat> now this is particularly relevant because, as I said, there's been a number of disinformation letters out there, people claiming remedy where you can go in and say that you are the both the beneficiary and the administrator of a, of a testamentary trust, uh, which is just complete insanity and will just prove to you being incompetent. So I need to explain to you.